So based on our first talk, right, ordinary and extraordinary means of care, now let's kind of start delving down into some of the, the real issues that, um, you know, that people are facing at end of life. And one that is maybe not as well known or people are as aware of is what we call medically assisted nutrition and hydration. Right, so you're gonna, I'm gonna, you'll see M-A-N-H, you saw it already previously. If you ever see that, that's what this means. So medically assisted nutrition hydration. This could be an IV line, this could be a feeding tube, those types of things, all right? And this is becoming um, even more so uh, of an issue, you know, as time goes by. I remember when I first started with the NCBC, it was, you would get some consults about it, but now we seem to be getting more and more consults about it, particularly in the context of uh, dementia patients. Uh, this question of, of medically assisted nutrition hydration is going to come up in a number of different ways. Um, we're going to talk about it more so in the next presentation, but it's certainly an issue with advanced directives, um, particularly with the living will, maybe a little bit less so with the power of attorney, but it does come up because there are many living wills, most secular living wills, allow people to choose to just categorically refuse nutrition and hydration, right? And we would say that that's a problem, right? Uh, as we'll talk about it here. The POLST form does the same thing, which we talked about a little bit earlier, the medical orders, um, uh, the, or the physician orders for life-sustaining care, or life-sustaining treatment, sorry, is what it should be. Um, POLST forms do the same thing. They allow people to categorically refuse nutrition and hydration even in situations where we would say it's an ordinary means of care. Um, another one is V said, we talked about this already, this is a growing trend across the country, particularly in states that have not legalized assisted suicide. What people tell patients is, oh, well, you wanna end your life? Just stop eating and drinking, right? And so this is happening uh, more and more today. And then finally, as I mentioned, uh, oh, sorry, two others, uh, nutrition and hydration for hospice patients. This can be an issue. We've run into this, um, and you know, we'll get to more about this this afternoon. But you know, we get calls from people who will say, you know, I want to, I'm thinking about enrolling my loved one in hospice, but they say they won't feed them. You know, as soon as they stop eating, they won't feed them anymore. Now, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot that needs to be discussed about that but to categorically refuse to help people to, you know, to eat and to drink, we would say that raises some questions, right? And we can talk about that. And lastly, uh, nutrition and hydration for end-stage dementia patients. We're getting this question more and more and more. Um, my 95-year-old mother has advanced dementia. Two weeks ago, she forgot, or she's, you know, she's forgotten how to swallow or she's forgotten how to eat. What is our moral responsibility, right? And this is, and those, those can be heartbreaking. They really can. Um, but these are issues that all revolve around this question of medically assisted nutrition and hydration. So in this presentation, what I'd like to do is give you the church's teaching on this. And there's, a, there's an interesting story, and I won't go through the whole story, um, but it really is quite an interesting story um, of where we are today on this question. All right, so to start, maybe this could, uh, this is kind of a typical type of question that we would get um, at the NCBC. So a little case study for you to think about this. So you have an 85-year-old man. Um, he's, the, he's experienced a uh, quote-unquote massive stroke. This is the things that are going ahead too quickly here. Um, he doesn't have any higher order brain activity, but his brain stem is working. And this, is, this will be important. We talked determining brain death this afternoon. But you've got your, you know, your higher order, your, your brain, you know, your thinking and your rationality and all the things you could do. And then there's your brain stem, which essentially controls your, you know, your breathing and your heartbeat and those types of things. So his brain stem is functional, but he has no higher order brain functions. His heartbeat, respiration, other things, other vital signs are stable. So, you know, aside from the massive stroke that he's had, he's, he's otherwise stable. The doctor has said to the family, um, that he or she does not recommend uh, providing nutrition and hydration to the patient. Um, and the doctor will use language such as, you know, if we do this, the patient will suffer horribly. 
You know, they're, they're, they'll experience bed sores, they'll experience this, that, and everything else. And by the way, don't worry about any discomfort surrounding uh, dehydration and or starvation. We'll, we'll give your father pain medication to mask all of that. So you don't need to worry about that. Two of the, uh, and I've actually had this consult, uh, two of the, look, the numbers are a little bit different, but you get the same idea. Two of the father's adult children say they agree with the doctor, they don't want nutrition hydration. Two of the adult children say we want nutrition and hydration because they, you know, they don't want to stand in front of God some, in part, they don't want to stand in front of God someday um, and having to explain how they quote unquote killed their father. You're the ethics expert. What do you do in this situation, All right? And this, this is a, a fairly, common, um, fairly common case study regarding nutrition and hydration. Uh, we're gonna be talking about medically assisted nutrition and hydration. Oftentimes you'll hear artificial nutrition and hydration. I can't stand that word. I just, I, that's, just, that's my pet peeve. I just, I can't stand it. It's not artificial, it's medically assisted. Um, but in church documents, they'll use the term artificial, but, you know, whatever. We're going to call it medically assisted nutrition and hydration. What is the definition of medically assisted nutrition and hydration? It's technological methods of delivering nutrition and hydration to patients whose needs can other, cannot sorry, otherwise be met due to their medical condition. In short, it's a patient is in a situation where he or she cannot feed themselves or cannot um, provide uh, necessary hydration for themselves, right? So it's, those are delivered by technological or medical means. And there's a number of different ways you can do it. I just, I, I just um, give three here, an NG tube, a nasogastric tube, a PEG tube, which is, is I, I always have trouble pronouncing this word, percutaneous, correct? I got it right, I usually get it wrong. Uh, a percutaneous endoscopic gastronomy tube. Say that 10 times fast, right? Uh, or TPN, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, is simply a central line that's providing nutrition and hydration to patients who are very ill. Um, so those are, and, and this picture here, which you can't see because the screen is kind of small, but it gives you, um, I can, again, I can send it to you if you want. It, it just gives some examples. So you've got the, the, the tube coming through the nose, or you've got some tubes going into the person's side there. I know it's, it's difficult to see here, but just to give a bit of a pictorial. A um, couple other pictorials, that would be essentially an NG tube right there. That's what that looks like. And that's essentially a peg, right? So just to give you a, a visual of what these, um, what these interventions look like, All right? So that is the story. Oh, before getting into it, a very, very important distinction. Is nutrition and hydration considered treatment or is it considered care? That's a very, very important question. Jerry, you put your hand up. Care. Jerry's gonna say it's care. Well, before we answer the question, let's define the terms here. What is treatment? Application of medicine, surgery, psychotherapy, et cetera, uh, to a patient or to a disease or symptom, right? You're treating some pathology in the person. Care, right? the provision what's needed for the well-being or protection of a person or thing, all right? So there's a distinction, treatment or care. And Jerry, our legal expert here, you'll, you'll hear from him next, he is absolutely right. From the Catholic perspective, right, nutrition and hydration is care. It's basic care. It's not a medical treatment. And you see some examples from church teaching. We're not gonna go through all of them except for John Paul's, we're gonna talk about his in a few minutes, all right? But the church is very clear that nutrition and hydration is basic care. It's not a medical treatment, all right? Why is this important? There are many states in the US that legally are seeking to redefine or redefine nutrition and hydration as treatment. And the reason they're doing it is so that it can be withheld or withdrawn from patients more easily, right? So be aware of that. And I don't know what Pennsylvania law is. I probably should have looked it up. We do so many of these. Maybe Jerry would know. Um, but just be aware that there are efforts, as there are efforts to legalize assisted suicide, maybe even euthanasia at some point, 
Um, one of the ways, one of the end of life issues that's being very quietly uh, adjudicated in our country is this changing of nutrition and hydration from care to a medical treatment, right? So just kind of be aware of that. So that's, to, to kind of summarize Catholic Church teaching, there's a presumption in favor of providing nutrition and hydration, right? So where does that come from, right? Well, it's always a good place to start is John Paul II. You guys remember John Paul II, right? It's really, it, I don't know if it's funny or if it's sad that I'll go to a, a high school or a college and I'll mention John Paul II and everybody just kind of goes, he's the guy in the picture up there, right? And it's like, yep. Um, really scary, like high school, college students now, don't eat, they weren't alive for 9-11. Think about that. Oh my goodness, I am so old. Anyway, so John Paul II, right? Um, and a little bit of a background to this. So there, there had been, particularly here in the United States, there had been, over the years prior to 2004, when John Paul II stated what he stated, there was um, good, vigorous debate here in the U.S. about, you know, well, what do we do about medically assisted nutrition and hydration? The bishops of, and I may, somebody correct me if I have this backwards, the bishops of Pennsylvania, I believe, were teaching that it was morally obligatory to provide nutrition and hydration, whereas the bishops of Texas were saying, well, no, it's extraordinary. And, it could, and I may have that backwards, I don't know. Um, if, if, I believe I have, it, I have it correct, but it could be the other way. So there's, you know, and, and ethicists or, you know, all of this. And then you remember Terry Schiavo, right? Uh, the whole Terry Schiavo situation, 2004-ish into 2005, right? So all of that was going on during this time as well. So there's a whole, and, and you know, we could talk for hours about all the debates and everything leading up to this. But basically, John Paul II, um, I don't believe he actually went to this um, International Congress of Physicians on Life-Sustaining Treatments. It, it happened in Rome, but this was about a year or so before John Paul II died. So he was, you know, he was in pretty rough shape, as many of us remember. But John Paul II um, gave, or someone read it for him, uh, what we call an allocution at this particular uh, physician's meeting. So John Paul II says this, and again, this is in light of all of the discussions going on as to, you know, is, is there a moral obligation, yes or no, to provide nutrition and hydration? John Paul II says this, the sick person in a vegetative state, right? I want to stop there for a second. Um, today, we really don't use that term, the patient in a persistent vegetative state. It's kind of, usually, today we'll use the term minimally conscious, something like that. But again, this was the John Paul II is using the language of his time. So the sick person in a vegetative state awaiting recovery or a natural end, and here he's talking about their death, still has the right to basic health care. And he lists nutrition, hydration, cleanliness, warmth, etc. And to the prevention of complications relating to his or her confinement to bed. Okay? What does this mean? I should particularly, I should like particularly, sorry, to underlie how the administration of water and food, even when provided by, he uses artificial, I hate that term, even when provided by artificial means, this is gonna be on the test, always represents a natural means of preserving life, not a medical act, all right? So John Paul clarifies church tea. He didn't make it up. He's not saying anything necessarily new here, but he's clarifying very clearly. I guess that's what you do when you're clarifying something. But he's making it very clear that food and water, even, by, even when provided by artificial or medically assisted means, is what? It's care. It's a natural means of preserving life. It's not a medical treatment. Therefore, its use, right? So providing nutrition and hydration, right? The use of nutrition and hydration. Its use, furthermore, should be considered, in principle, ordinary and proportionate, right? Going back to what we talked about um, 
in the last presentation. Its use furthermore should be considered in principle ordinary and proportionate insofar as and until it is seen to have attained its proper finality, which in the present case consists of providing nourishment to the patient and alleviation of his or her suffering. So John Paul II, you know, plants the flag and says, you know, all these discussions that are going on, no. Nutrition and hydration are an ordinary means of care. And as we learned in the last presentation, if something is an ordinary means of care, is it morally obligatory or morally optional? That was kind of pathetic. Let's try that again. As we learned in the last presentation, is an ordinary means of care morally obligatory or morally um, optional? Thank you. Thank you. It was obligatory. Yes. All right. So John Paul II stated that very clearly. Now we know that um, you know, John Paul II was very ill and, um, at the time and everything else. And his statement really, and I don't know if people remember, I, re I remember it, I was, um, had just, we, my wife and I had just moved to Ohio and was teaching at a school there. And I remember the, just the, the, like all sorts of discussion and everything you know, happened about it. And, you know, people are critiquing it, and some people loved it, some people disliked it, and all this other stuff that was going on. And so what the U.S. bishops did, and this is what a, a dubia is, so what bishops can do, and they do do this, and there's been some history lately about dubias, which we won't necessarily go into here, but basically what can happen is if, let's say, a pope teaches something, and there's some question about it, or there's some clarification about it, like something's just not 100% clear, what bishops can do is issue what's called a dubia, which is basically it's a question. And they can, it, they can send it to Rome, and it goes to an office called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Actually, today I think it's called the Discastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, but um, here you'll see the CDF, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And this is essentially the church's... Um, theological office, or I call it the theological watchdog office. It's the office that makes sure that what's taught as Catholic teaching actually is Catholic teaching. Anybody know who the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith was under Pope John Paul II? Don, you already answered. Anybody know? It was Joseph Ratzinger, who we know as? Pope Not Pope Gregory, Pope Benedict. Benedict. Pope Benedict, there you go. Yeah, so, um, so under Pope John Paul II, the head, who's called the prefect for the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, was Joseph Ratzinger, who you know, became Benedict XVI. So it's a very, very important office. So this is what the U.S. bishops did. There was questions, it was like, you know, because John Paul II, he, he put out this statement, and that was kind of it. That's all that came out. And there were some questions, some clarifying questions, not to, not to try to, crit to criticize or critique the document, but just to get, we, like, we need to get some absolute clarity here in terms of exactly what is John Paul II saying. So, John Paul II dies, and uh, he died in April of uh, 2005, and fairly soon thereafter, the U.S. bishops as a whole sent a dubia to Rome. It's asking a couple, you'll see the questions in a second. Asking a couple questions, and then the CDF responds to those questions. And that's, it's, you know, this is one of the ways that the church clarifies her teachings on various issues. So the, um, so the U.S. bishops sent their dubia to Rome. And in 2007, yes, 2007, the CDF responded back. And it's a big, long name. Um, it basically responses to certain questions. And then there's like three lines worth of title. And then it says, concerning artificial nutrition and hydration. Right? So the CDF is responding. This is the CDF's response to questions posed by the US bishops. So the first question that the US bishops asked is this. So this is in light of John Paul II's 2004 uh, allocution, the statement, the, the section that we just read. All right, question one. The bishops asked, US bishops, is the administration of food and water whether by natural or artificial, you got artificial again, whether by natural or artificial means to a patient in a quote-unquote vegetative state, and again, think Terry Schiavo, right? Is the administration of food and water, whether by natural or artificial means to a patient in a vegetative state, morally obligatory? 
response from the CDF? Yes. Yes, it is. And then they go on. Yes, the administration of food and water, even by artificial means, is in principle. Hold on to that. All right? Hold on to that. In principle, remember presumption in favor of? This is where this is going to become important. Um, administration of food and water, even by artificial means, is in principle an ordinary and proportionate means of preserving life. It is therefore, that was really bad. It is therefore, excellent. To the extent to which, and for long as it is shown, to accomplish its, its, to accomplish its proper finality, which is the hydration and nourishment of the patient, right? What this, accomplish its proper finality means the food and water are doing what they're intended to do, right? Provide hydration, provide nourishment to the patient, right? In this way, and this is key right here, in this way, suffering and death by starvation and dehydration are prevented. That's key. I've had um, consults, true story, and I've had to do this twice, and I don't know what the result was but it was consults about nutrition and hydration for a patient and going through you know, the steps of doing it, which we're gonna go through in a couple seconds here. I would certainly believe that providing nutrition and hydration was ordinary, but the person I was on the phone with disagreed. And they were, they were you know, that we weren't like nasty yelling or anything else. It wasn't like, you know, TV, whatever, debates, no. It was, but it was a good, good, healthy debate. But in the end, I had to say, to the person, these two people, so you're okay starving your mother to death. Because that's what they were doing. And both times it was kind of dead silence. And um, well, I never really thought about it like that. And I said, well, maybe you should start thinking about it like that. And that's what this is, right? That's what the CDF is saying. Why are, we, why are we doing this? Because we don't want the person's cause of death to be starvation or dehydration, right? And that's really important. That's a key point to all of this. So question number two, there were two questions that the US bishops asked. Question number two is this one. All right, now think of specifically uh, Terry Schiavo. All right, question two, when nutrition and hydration are being supplied by artificial means, is that word again? to a patient in a permanent vegetative state, again, today would probably use the term minimally conscious state, may they be discontinued, a la Terry Schiavo, may they be discontinued when competent physicians judge with moral certainty that the patient will never recover consciousness. Okay, so you have a Terry Schiavo type of situation. Doctors have determined with moral certainty that she will never regain consciousness Little asterisk there. I know Terry's brother, um, Bobby Schindler, and Bobby will say what was presented in the media about her situation was completely wrong. Um, just it, it really is quite heartbreaking um, when you hear sort of the inside story of that. But anyway, basically what the bishops are asking, in a, in a situation like Terry Schiavo's, where doctors are sure, quote unquote, that this patient will never regain consciousness, can we remove nutrition and hydration? Response from the CDF? Response, no. You can't remove it in a Terry Schiavo type situation, even though they did, or at least her husband did. No, a patient in a permanent vegetative state is a person with fundamental human dignity and must therefore receive ordinary and proportionate care, which includes in principle, there is that in principle again, the administration of food and water, okay? So what the CDF did was essentially restate what John Paul II said, all right? Uh, nutrition and hydration, it's ordinary, right? excuse me, it's, a, it's, it's not a medical treatment, it's care, right? And if, the med if um, nutrition and hydration are gonna accomplish their finality, i.e. hydrating the person's body, providing nutrition for that body, it's ordinary, and therefore it's morally obligatory. Now the CDF, um, this is the in principle 
right? And that they, you know, in principle, you have a moral obligation to provide it. But the CDF also recognizes that there are certain exceptions to this. Now, the document does not use the word exceptions, right? There's these big, long, fancy terminology, but essentially they're saying, by the way, there's a, there are a few exceptions to this, right? And they spell out what those exceptions are. So what are some of the exceptions to providing nutrition and hydration? And one of them, it's kind of duh, well, if it's physically impossible to do, due to one's location or circumstances. So for example, if we're traveling across the Sahara Desert and somebody's in need of a feeding tube and we don't have a feeding tube, is there a moral obligation to provide it? And the answer is no, obviously there isn't. Do I have a moral obligation to, to insert a feeding tube? No, I don't because I'm not a doctor, I can't do it. I see George Asayu back there, he may, I don't know if he, if he does or not, but uh, if he has the, you know, the, the ability to do that, but a, a physician who does, so I guess he does, all right? But I don't because I'm not a physician, right? I could try to do it, but it, would be, it wouldn't be good. All right, so if it's physically, if you can't do it, there's no, obviously there's no obligation to do it. Another exception, quote unquote, is when a patient's body is no longer able to assimilate nutrition and hydration, and that can happen, it does happen, right? Particularly at end of life, right? If a patient's body, if you're going to provide nutrition and hydration, and it, I'm trying to be delicate here, um, it sort of just kind of runs through the patient's body, you can use your imagination, and it's not providing any benefit, and actually it could be, could be causing a burden to the patient, is there an obligation to provide it? No, absolutely not. Right? Again, remember the nutrition and hydration has to be able to um, attain its proper finality. Right? And if it can't do that, then obviously there's no moral obligation to do it. Thirdly, the means of providing nutrition and, uh, nutrition and hydration are excessively burdensome for the patient. This is where you get into that ordinary versus extraordinary based on the particular situations of a patient. And I just give some example. Oh, shoot, where did they go? Oh. I, I think I'm going to talk about it in the next slide. Hang on, let's, let's hold on there. All right, the means of providing. So let's say the, um, the, the feeding tube or the IV. Could they in themselves become extraordinary? They can. I put the examples on the next slide, not on this one. My bad. So that being said, right, so the CDF came back. That response came back, and it came back to the U.S. bishops. And then what the bishops did was they revised the ethical and religious directives. That's what the ERD up there is, the ethical and religious directives. So what they did was they revised Directive 58, which had to do with nutrition and hydration, and they revised that in 2009. And the language that we have in the ERDs on Directive 58 is, comes directly from that. So what does ERD 58, and this is a summary, and you, the whole thing is, you know, it's in the notes, or you can look at it in the ERDs if you, um, if you want to do so. But essentially what Directive 58 says is this. In principle, there's an obligation to provide food and water, including medically assisted nutrition and hydration. Just repeating John Paul II, repeating the, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. It is permissible, however, and these are the exceptions. It is permissible, however, to withhold or withdraw um, medically assisted nutrition and hydration under certain circumstances. And the first circumstance is, as we already mentioned, the patient can't assimilate, again, right? You can't absorb the food, you can't, or excuse me, um, digest the food, you can't, you know, the, the, the hydration's not gonna accomplish its end, no moral obligation to provide it. Secondly, the pro uh, providing it, uh, transitions are messed up here. Um, secondly, the provision, the feeding tube, um, it brings about or it, or it constitutes an excessive burden for the patient. So for example, and these are just examples, right? Um, situations where, let's say a patient is, they have a feeding tube, and they experience repeated uh, aspiration pneumonia, which is basically um, the nutrition comes into their stomach, and they aspirate it. Essentially, they throw it up, and it goes into their lungs. It causes infections. Not a good thing, all right? That's, okay, this is an excessive burden. Right? And that is an indication that, you know, maybe this can be withdrawn or withheld. Actually, probably would. Uh, a recurring infection. Let's say where the tube comes into my body. That's a spot of recurring infection. 
that could be as well. We've also run across situations, and this is, this is me speaking, and people may disagree with this, um, We've had situations where, you know, there'll be a patient, particularly like a dementia patient, who may have a feeding tube or may have a ventilator as well, and they constantly pull the tubes out, and they have to be restrained in order not to do that. Yeah. I would say that, you know, if someone has to be restrained, that could, that could indicate that this has become an extraordinary means of care, right? Again, but it's going to be um, situation-specific. And then the third uh, exception that the uh, ERD 58 speaks about is if death is imminent due to the underlying condition. So let's go back to, was it Peter Paul from this morning who had cancer? I forgot. Peter, Paul, which are one of the apostles, I don't know, whatever. Um, our friend Pete this morning who, you know, he was on his fourth um, round of cancer and, you know, his body is shutting down right, let's, he, we're, we're fast forwarding some period of time. His body is shutting down um, and he is, you know, he, he's very close to death. The question will come up, well, do we have an obligation to provide food and water to this person? And one of the things that the bishops will say is, well, you know, if, it's an, if, it's, if the person is actively dying and they are going to die from their underlying condition, you know, before they would die of, new, of starvation or dehydration, then there's no moral obligation to provide it, right? But again, the key here is that the withholding of nutrition and hydration is not what causes death. What's causing death is the underlying, you know, their underlying medical condition, right? And as we, most of us know as well too, as people are moving towards death, they, people eat less and they drink less. They're not, they, their bodies don't need it. And sometimes people, you know, when people are, are calling us in consults, you know, they're really worried that, oh my goodness, you know, my mother hasn't eaten anything in three days or hasn't eaten anything a week or has only eaten very little. And we say, you know, that's very natural, right? That's a natural thing. And that's, you know, another um, issue to be, um, you know, to be addressed in all of this, right? Um, where are we? Some related topics. Um, and I kind of mentioned this before. These are these are some of the practical issues that we see. Um, some of these are a bit, a bit of repetition from earlier today. So um, nutrition and hydration in advanced directives. We see this all the time. As I mentioned before, and Jerry's gonna talk about it. Um, it's a Holy Spirit calling. I <laughs> might wanna take that. Could be a vocation, I don't know. Um, but anyway, um, many um, advanced directives. Even some Catholic advanced directives hmm, allow people to categorically refuse nutrition and hydration. And that, it's actually in violation of church teaching, right? So be aware of that in terms of um, your advanced directives. Uh, voluntary stopping of eating and drinking, as I mentioned um, previously, and you see the definition uh, up here. Um, it's essentially a person who wants to end his or her life, and they do it by stopping eating, right? And it's a, you know, it, it's a real, uh, real issue. John Paul II, not referring to this specifically, but, you know, he said if we, if we, um, if we knowingly fail to provide someone nutrition and hydration who needs it and would benefit from it, that's euthanasia by omission, right? And that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, and I'm just going to kind of skip through this because I know we're kind of up against it. But V said um, there's a lot of ethical challenges even for physicians because what we'll hear is that there are physicians who will say, you know, you, wanna, um, you want to you know, end your life by stopping and eating and drinking. Well, I'll palliate your symptoms. You know, you won't feel anything because I'm going to give you medications to mask the symptoms of dehydration and starvation. And then you get into really important questions of cooperation with evil and this, that, and everything else. So there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of issues um, to this here. Late stage dementia patients, um, yeah, this is a big one. And as I say, we're getting this question more and more uh, as time goes by. Oops. And there's, a, there's actually a, a really interesting um, video lecture that we did um, with a, uh, a physician on this topic. Um, so if, if anybody's interested, and this would be in the notes, I could send that to you if you wanted. Um, but it's a tough, tough situation. What do we do in these situations? How do we thread that needle? Um, you know, when you have dementia patients who they can't make decisions for themselves, they don't understand what's going on, they're not eating, but they're, they're not actively dying. 
you know, what do you, what do, you do? How do you, and again, they can be uh, very, very, very difficult. We have a number of resources, and I'll just finish up here because I know we're, we're kind of up against it on time. But we've got a lot of different resources on the whole question of nutrition and hydration. As you can see, the dates of some of these uh, things that came out at the time when um, John Paul II's elocution, and then the CDF responses, and then revising ERD 58. Uh, in our Catholic Healthcare Ethics Manual, which is actually out at the table, you could take a look at that if you wanted. We have chapters in there uh, on these topics. And again, I'm more than happy to send, um, send a lot of these materials to you. And what else do we have up here? One of our podcasts, our Bioethics on Air podcast, we did an interview with Bobby Schindler, who's Terry Schiavo's brother. And he talked about uh, the whole situation with Terry and what the media didn't, uh, didn't tell you. And then, and then lastly, the guides that I mentioned before, I'm gonna mention them again and again and again today. Um, we have some copies out there, I'm happy to give some out at the end of the day, but again, they're available on our website.